So look at these examples here, starting on page 23, okay? And we'll go through the uh, examples related to the Compton effect or more generally to the momentum of a photon, at least at the beginning here, okay? So the energy of a photon is 3.6 times 10 to the negative 14 joules. What is its momentum? So you could you figure out its wavelength, take the momentum, plug it into here, and then solve for lambda. Or again, this is also an equation you have. These equations are easy to turn into each other, okay? This just saves us a step. So rearranging and plugging in. Actually pretty straightforward, right? That's what I got. New equation, let's do a unit check. So a joule over a meter per second. Remember a joule, mv squared. That's always the equation I go to to remember what a joule is. So mv squared is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. We have a meter squared over a meter. So that cancels. We have a oh, we have a one over second squared over a one over second. So one of the one over seconds cancels. And look at that. Kilograms, meters per second. What's that the unit of? momentum never did one here but we could and look at that same thing kilogram meter per second okay a photon a proton and an electron walk into bar each have a momentum of 2.47 times 10 to the negative 23 kilogram meters per second what is the speed of each so this example drives home that you cannot use p equals h over lambda for particles okay Remember that step we took in the derivation assumed that this object was traveling at the speed of light. Electrons and, and protons can not ever. They have a mass. Nothing with a mass can ever go the speed of light. Ever, 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 ever. A fundamental law of our universe that arises through Einstein's work on relativity. That's for another year for you. So if they all have the same momentum, what's the speed of each? So for the photon, well, what's the speed of a photon? Trick question always that never say anything other than that for the speed of a photon okay ever for a proton okay well just a reminder okay for massive particles momentum is mass times velocity for non-massive particles like photons momentum is h over lambda okay this is very important to remember never use this for an electron or proton Never use this for a photon because you'll always get zero for that top one. So that means for a proton, okay, and then just plugging in the mass of a proton on the back of your formula sheet. So I got, okay, and for the electron, electrons have mass, they are massive particles, so we will use P over M and the mass of an electron again on your formula sheet. And I got, ooh, that's fast. That is so fast, in fact that if you were at a certain point in your physics studies in university and you had learned the theory of relativity, you would have to redo this calculation, considering something that you had not considered before. That is 10%-ish of the speed of light, a little less than 10% of the speed of light. That is a speed that we would call relativistic, which means that these non-relativistic equations actually would not describe reality for that electron or for us observing that electron, okay? However, in high school, that's just fine. We'll use our non-relativistic equations. Okay. Red light hits a stationary electron. The electron moves off with 0 0.5 electron volts of energy. Let's just go ahead and turn that into joules. So that is just by the fact that half of an electron volt is, well, half of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. All right, what is the new wavelength of light and what type of EMR is it now? So. You can solve Compton scattering problems with the conservation of momentum and the conservation of energy in theory. But to solve it with momentum, what do you need? Right, you need a direction. You need to know something about what direction it was scattered. That didn't happen here. They only gave us energy. So, which of course direction really translates to angle, right? So we can't use physics principle four. We're gonna have to use physics principle number five. Conservation of energy, our old friend, which honestly is usually easier anyway. So unless we need a direction, in which case we'll have to use the conservation of momentum. So all the energy before equals all the energy after. What is the system we're dealing with here? Well, it's the photon and the electron. So the energy of the photon initially plus the energy of the electron initially has to equal their final energies. Initially, the electron does not really have energy, okay? At least 
this interaction is going to give it so much more energy than it has now that it'll be negligible. Okay. So what's the energy of the photon initially? Well, what's the energy of a photon? HF or HC over lambda. We're given a lambda. So let's do that. HC over lambda, but lambda initial. Because remember, Compton scattering is going to change the wavelength. So the initial wavelength is what determines the initial energy, which means, of course, energy of the photon final is HC over lambda final. And we were given the energy of the electron, so we can just leave it like that. We don't even need to mv squared this. So looking for the final wavelength, that's what I want to know. So let's do some manipulation here. Okay, get that out of the denominator because we'll never solve for it while it's down there. And then we'll just divide both sides by this whole bracket. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Might not be the prettiest solution, but it'll work. Okay, we're ready to plug in. I got that the final wavelength would be 7.91 times 10 to the negative seven meters or 791 nanometers. Why change it to nanometers? Well, that helps me compare it to visible light because the question asked, what type is it? So visible light, 300-ish to 700-ish, right? This is just above 700. So is 700 the red end or the violet end? That's the bigger wavelength end, which is the lower energy end, which is red light, right? So this is just beyond red. So it's the type of light that literally means just below red, right? Infrared. Okay, now this one is using the equation that only applies to Compton scattering. So those other ones, again, they apply to a photon doing anything, really, right? Because all we were talking about was the momentum. This equation really only applies to Compton scattering because it's derived using that exact scenario. So this X-ray hits foil and scatters at an angle of 40 degrees, so that's obviously theta, after colliding with an electron. Calculate the wavelength of the scattered X-ray. So this is the wavelength of the X-ray before the collision, obviously, and we want to know lambda f. Again, let's just kind of visualize this. We have one coming in. It's going to hit an electron, right? And then afterwards, the photon is going to be scattered out at a longer wavelength. The electron's going to head out that way. And what is theta? Where is theta? It's the angle between the photon's new trajectory and its original trajectory. So this is theta. But the math just really comes down to applying our formula carefully here. So the change in wavelength is equal to... Okay, and remember that m is the mass of the massive particle. Don't put zero in there for a photon. It'll never work because this will always be undefined if m is zero, right? Okay, so we could find the change in wavelength first and then add it to the initial wavelength. Or you could right now just go ahead and say that. And then we can get lambda f directly out of this. Your choice. However, I will pause here for a second to say if you are going to find the change in wavelength and then add it, B, this is really a time where you need to carry a lot a lot, a lot of sig digs because sometimes the change in wavelength is very small, very slight, okay? And you might not even notice it because it'll be in the seventh or eighth decimal place. So if you don't carry those, you can run into trouble. So for sure for Compton scattering, carry pretty much every decimal place on your calculator if you're going to not just solve it all at once. Okay, so let's plug in. Mass of the massive particle, so in this case, an electron. Usually an electron, not always. Okay, type that all very carefully into your calculator. You will get that the final wavelength is 1.3 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. Okay, some more kind of theory-ish questions here. So a student is given the task of designing a demonstration that is analogous to a phenomenon studied in physics 30. Analogous basically just means it provides an analogy. So it's not really the experiment, but you could maybe use it to picture the experiment with different ideas, okay? So they roll ball X down the ramp to see if it will knock ball Q up onto the platform. And then they repeat with balls Y and Z. X, Y, and Z are all made of the same material and therefore have the same density. Okay, so that's just saying that, yes, because X is bigger, you can assume it has more mass. If they have the same density and density is mass per volume, then that just means more volume equals more mass, right? So this demonstration is analogous to, is it the photoelectric effect, the Compton effect, black body radiation, or wave interference? Well, black body radiation, what does this have to do with black body radiation? 
right? Black body radiation is that as particles absorb radiation and therefore warm up, they start to, they radiate that back out. And the more energy they have, the more they radiate it out. It doesn't make sense. Nothing to do with black body here. Wave interference, these are not acting like waves, right? So it's between the photoelectric effect and the Compton effect, right? The fact that we're even using particles to begin with should kind of make you think, I bet this is something quantum like the photoelectric or the Compton effect, okay? Now, now the Compton effect is all about, it acts as a particle, but then it's scattered in a way that momentum is conserved. It is not though all or nothing, right? The photon continues on, it's not destroyed. It doesn't either happen or not. You can get different degrees of Compton scattering. Now it is a one and done interaction. It is particle-like behavior. However, the particle is not just destroyed like in the photoelectric effect, right? Here in the photoelectric effect, this is all or nothing, right? X either knocks Q up or it doesn't. And then Z either does it or doesn't. Y does it or doesn't, right? If it fails, it fails, that's it, it's over. So that sounds a lot like the photoelectric effect. All or nothing, one and done, an electron either pops up, pops out, or it does not. Q either pops up or it does not. Okay, when we manipulate ball X, Y, and Z, what are we manipulating? Well, the mass, right? Like we said, the speed, we wouldn't be manipulating the speed because you'll recall from physics 20 that regardless of mass, objects fall at the same speed, right? So speed will not be changing there, so eliminate C and D. Now, it's manipulating the ball's mass and therefore it's energy or work function. Well, definitely energy, right? work function doesn't even really make sense here because we're not actually doing the photoelectric effect we're simulating it right but by manipulating the mass we're manipulating the amount of energy it starts with and therefore the amount of energy it's going to hit q with okay now you might be saying to yourself hang on you just said that it won't move any faster yeah exactly it won't because it gets more kinetic energy from its mass not from its speed mv squared mgh Okay, so definitely energy. I mean, that right away tells us A, but let's think about this a bit more. For this reason, it is analogous to manipulating the, so now in the photoelectric effect, what are we manipulating when, we, when a photon has more energy? Because the balls are like photons here, right? Well, to give a photon more energy, we have to give it a higher frequency, right? Threshold frequency we have to meet. So we can think of the balls as having a threshold mass and if they're above that threshold mass, they will knock Q up onto the platform. If they are below it, like maybe Y is, they will definitely never do that, right? So the mass here is analogous to the frequency of the photon. All right, a physics teacher describes an experiment in which an electromagnetic radiation wave collides with a particle and both deflect at some angle. Oh, okay, both deflect at some angle. The teacher begins to draw a simple diagram representing the experiment and asks students to complete it. Okay, so this is the start of a diagram. We can see there the wave has come in and it's made contact with the particle. So first things first, the teacher is describing an experiment performed by the scientist named blank. So either Einstein or Compton. So Einstein, photoelectric effect. Compton, Compton scattering. What's the difference? What's one of the big differences there? Well, in the photoelectric effect, the photon is completely absorbed. It's destroyed and its energy goes into kinetic energy of the electron and used up by the work function to even get the electron to come out in the first place, okay? Is that what's happening here? No, both deflect at some angle. That's characteristic of the Compton effect where the photon continues to exist, albeit with a longer wavelength, but it continues to exist and propagate, right? And the electron just bounces off at some other angle to conserve momentum. So definitely this is describing the Compton effect, okay? And students correctly complete the diagram by showing the wave have a shorter wavelength or a larger wavelength. Well, we kind of just said it, right? But if it's going to impart momentum to the electron, because we know the electron is going to scatter off and P equals H over lambda, it can't, there's no free momentum. It can't just magically give the electron momentum. It has to give it its own momentum. It has to lose momentum, right? So losing momentum means, losing momentum means larger wavelength, right? And so... D is our answer. Okay, that's all the examples for topic three. So now you can check the agenda or Google Classroom for the practice questions that specifically go with topic three here.